Today, I'm going to get your taste buds tingling. I'm cooking with onions, spices, and a good dose of peppermint to cool it all down. It'll be hot and it'll be hearty. Sweet or savoury, there'll be something for everyone as I show you how to make simple recipes that are perfect to share. Here's what's on the menu today. Coming up on Pies and Puds, I find out the secret to producing delicious onions all year round. And I fulfil a childhood dream. I've always wanted to drive a tractor. I love it. I'm going to give up my job. I don't want to be a baker anymore. You can leave me here. And onions are the star ingredient in my creamy, savoury tart, with grainy, whole grain mustard giving it some extra sweetness. And that will make a beautiful onion tart. I'm baking a gorgeously rich chocolate dessert with a touch of something special. There's a heady mix going on here between chocolate and peppermint that you can't smell, so you're going to have to make it. And it's all thanks to my guest, Sir Michael Coleman, more famous for his mustard, but it's his cool peppermint oil I'll be using. How do you use that peppermint oil yourself? I've got my wife trained. She really likes peppermint tea. Ah. And when is a pie not a pie? When it's a biryani, of course, created by my old friend and Indian food expert, Manju Mali. That's not a biryani. That's it a is. pie. No, it's not That's pie. That's got a lid on it. But what definitely is a pie is my Russian-inspired puff pastry dish filled with rice, salmon and boiled eggs. But doesn't it look lovely? The colours look incredible. Mm. And my guests today are the lucky ones, as they get to tuck into all my pies and puds. I think it's... The layers yes. of the egg. Beautiful. I love onions, mate, from having them on hot dogs or a cheese and onion butty. But how much do we really know about the complexity that they bring to our dishes? Well, the answer, for me at least, is not enough. We all love our onions, but I want to know my onions, so I've come to Parish Farms in Bedfordshire to get to grips with the best of the bunch. Paul Cripsy has been growing all types of onions for decades, and he certainly knows his stuff. Hello, Paul. Oh, hello, hello, mate. Paul. Nice to meet you. Checking your onions? Yes, yeah, just checking these, uh, these round shallots um, and seeing if they're ready for harvest, which, uh, which they are. So how many different varieties of onion and shallots do you actually grow here? Well, um, on the farm here, we grow brown onions, red onions. Uh, we grow the round shallots, the banana shallot. How long have you been doing this? Some 35 years, yes, yeah. So yeah. imagine things have changed over that time. Before the 1970s, the onions were lifted and dried in the field. But the problem with the English weather uh, then is that September time, it used to rain. And the, uh, the skinners used to get spotty and black. Since so in the 1970s, a system was developed for doing uh, the harvesting, taking them to store which enabled us to actually produce an onion with a lovely skin finish because you're buying with your eyes. So you're now finally being able to compete with the Spanish on, on a level playing field then? Yes, yes we have and, and all the drying is done in a store where we create the Spanish weather conditions. Hot, not too bit humid. Bit of sangria on the side, pool table, <laughs> yes. swimming, bit yeah. of salty water. Well, not quite as easy as that. <laughs> So if, we, if we get it right, we'll have the sangria. There are three stages to the onion harvest. First of all, this machine tops the plants by slicing off the leaves. Next, the onions are unearthed and strewn out behind it, left to dry naturally in the sun for up to 24 hours. Finally, it's time to load the onions up before dropping them into a waiting container on this tractor. And that's where I come in. I'm happy to help in any way. If well, I can get to drive a tractor, well, that'd be actually, brilliant. We are a bit short today. What, uh, drivers? The drivers, yeah. Oh, yes, so uh, nice. it would be really good if you could just help your hand. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Have you driven a tractor before? I have when I was about 12 years old, straight into a tree. Here we are, Paul. This is your tractor for the day. Now, 
Um, it's a big, big machine, 24 tons. But I must warn you, Paul, if you spill any, you've yeah. got to pick them up by hand. OK, are you happy? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> okay. that's fine. I'll give it a go. I've always wanted to drive a tractor, and now I'm driving a tractor. I love it. I'm going to give up my job. I don't want to be a baker anymore. You can leave me here. In Britain, we're now producing around 70,000 tonnes of onions every year. And with constant improvements in the industry, happily for us, it means the British onion can be in our shops all year round. This is the end of the shallot harvesting journey. Uh, they're coming now into the drying rooms here. And uh, we're going to actually now create the Spanish weather conditions. We're going to blow air through them at uh, 28 degrees centigrade to dry them all off and colour them up and these will be ready for sale in about four weeks' time. And they will actually can stay in this, in this drying room and storage room till about next June. So it's, uh, it's, it can be a, a long-term store. I do feel now I know a little bit more about onions slash shallots. Um, having driven the tractor, you know, and uh, loaded it all up, brought it all here, it's sitting on its conveyor belt now, heading off to the storeroom, where it's going to be sitting in Spanish heat for potentially anything up to a year, which I find amazing. I'm going to bake a shallot and onion tart, so I want to know which varieties have the most flavour. Dr Mariel Jones has an experiment comparing the flavour of a red and white onion. So the whole thing you do, you test onions in your laboratory. What I'm going to do here is show a way in which you can assess how flavourful an onion is without having to actually eat it. <laughs> I mean, I like actually raw onion in a, in, a, in a butty, but when you cook it down, it totally changes. It becomes sweet. The reason why they become sweet is because the sweetness is from sugars in the onion, and when you cook it, all the onion's characteristic pungent flavour is taken away in the cooking process. It floats off. But Dr Mariel is going to be testing which onion, a red or white one, has the most flavour when it's raw with a little experiment. Basically, you add a reagent that reacts with the... A reagent? You add a chemical. OK. OK. You what chemical are you adding? It forms a phenyl hydrazone, which is I'm a... I'm sorry. Can we give <laughs> <laughs> a phenyl hydrazone. And is it, that's not something you buy in a shop? No, no, no. <laughs> but what, what, what's a phenyl hydrazone? So... It, it's a chemical grouping that absorbs light, so it's coloured. Testing. And I thought onions were simple. Okay. Sorry, you've got what in there? Pyruvic acid and by an enzyme. OK, I think I'm going to let the good doctor get on with it. Mariel adds a reagent to the onions in the test tubes and places them in the water bath. Okay. Is everybody keep it up? Sure. Time to find out the results. Which of our onions has the most flavour? You can see that there's definitely flavour in them. Yes. Uh, there's more in the white one than the red onion. Ah, so the white one is the darker one. Yeah. And the red one, ironically, it's is the lighter, lighter one. one. Yeah. OK. So, the onion with the strongest flavour from our batch is the white onion. And the stronger the onion, the more flavour it's going to add to my tart. Mariel, I love that out there. But tables are 10 now. Now you're in my realm. What I've actually chosen is a, a white onion. I've chosen a banana shallot. Oh. And I've got some chives in there. So it's the flavoursome white onions that make it into my first dish, along with banana shallots and chopped chives. And by using three different types of onions, I'm hoping for a range of savoury flavours in my creamy shallot, onion and chive tart. Now, I've actually given you some chives there. Can you do me, I tell you what, do me a little favour. Mm -hmm. Cut them up, just little pieces. So you okay. probably have to trim it off and then just cut them probably about, about halfway down, okay. all right? Now, to start with, to make your onion tart, you need flour, to which you're going to add some lard and some butter. Do you like using lard? Have you ever used lard when, you, when you're oh, cooking? Yeah. yeah, do you use yeah. it all the time? Oh, only in some things. What Wait. do you use it in? Welsh cakes. Welsh cakes? Yeah, and pastry. Why do you add lard, then? I know why I like add lard. Why do you add lard? You know, it alters the texture. It makes it a much better texture than just using margarine or butter on its own. 
OK, I've got my lard in there. I'm going to add my butter. You're doing a good job with those uh, chives there. And now what I'm doing here, I'm basically just rubbing the lard and the butter into the flour, crush it down, and the lard does add to it. It adds texture, but it also adds that emulsifier to the dough, I find, as well, which seals stuff in. Now, I've used lard and butter, but for the veggie option, you can just use butter. Mix until you get a good crumb structure. Add seasoning and a little cold water until the pastry dough comes together. Pop that onto the bench, get a little bit of flour, just dust it lightly, and then you just give it a little bit of a knead. That is enough, just a couple of turns, turns it together into a lovely bit of pastry. You wrap that up and then pop it into the fridge. Just leave it in there for about 10, 15 minutes. It just solidifies it and makes it easier when you roll it out. So that'll go in the fridge. And once it's been in the fridge, I'll show you this one here. Show you the difference. You can see it's, it's a little bit more elastic. It's a little bit more forgiving when you roll it out. Start by rolling the pastry so it's large enough to cover the tin base and the sides. The pastry should be rolled out to a minimum of five millimetres. One of my little jobs in, in, when in my dad's bakery when I was about 12 years old was actually making apple pies. And one of the things you do when you're making apple pies is you roll this pastry really thin. I used to do about 20 lids and about 20 bases. But half the time, I never used flour. So the whole thing just broke down in my hands. And my dad walked in and says, I'm going to knock it out of your way. He said, but, Dad, you don't give me any money. So it took me about a year to pay him back. I reckon that's about there. I like to roll it around a rolling pin. Bring over your tart dish, and then basically just roll it out across the top, like so. And then all you do is basically fit it into your, your tart case. Now, I'm just going to take a little bit of this pastry off the side and push to get right into the corners. Just use your pastry and go all the way around. Go across the top with your hands, release the extra bit of pastry, and then neaten it all off, all the way around. And there you have a beautifully lined tart base. Line the tin with baking parchment and fill with baking beans, firmly pushing the beans to the edge to prevent the paper from lifting up. Now, that needs to go into the oven for about 20 minutes at 180 fan and blind bake it. Once you've baked it, this is how it turns out. It's beautiful, it's dry, and it's nice and neat. Now, the next stage is to prepare the filling. What I'm going to do is pop my onions straight into the tart case. Now, these onions, you just need to spread them out. So the idea is to keep them as cool as possible and keep all the moisture in that onion. Is there an actual way of, of, of cutting an onion without crying too much? Yes. I mean, don't cut it at the root base, at the bottom end of the onion. Use a sharp knife. And Why? It means you're cutting less cells, releasing less flavour. And you want the flavour in your dish. You don't want it floating off into your eyes. So that will prevent yeah. as much going in your eye. Yeah. You'll still cry. I always do. I'm <laughs> pathetic. <laughs> Next, prepare the custard. OK, three eggs. That's my fourth egg. Now, what I'm going to do is add a yolk so I'm going to enrich this custard. What do you do with all these whites that are left over? Meringue. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Beautiful meringue, pavlova. Then add double cream, chopped chives and whole grain mustard. I think this blends so well with the, with the onion. I think it's a marriage made in heaven. Gently whisk together, then pour over your onions. Allow to soak in before finally filling it to the top of the baked pastry case. And that will make a beautiful mm. onion tart. Looks lovely. Pop your tart straight on your tray and then bake this off for 30 minutes. This one here has been baked beautifully for 30 minutes. Just run your palette knife underneath and then just release it onto the tray. I promise you that is going to be delicious. So there it is. My tart is perfect as a scrumptious supper for all the family. 
serve warm rather than piping hot. For me, it's a real and deserved celebration of our great British onions. You can't eat it now. No. We'll have it a bit later. OK, right. good. Still to come on Pies and Puds. I'm celebrating a long-lost British flavour. I absolutely love this stuff. You have to cherish this crop. Which is a key ingredient in my delicious roulade. So you gently fold this together. And I create a Russian-inspired puff pastry pie filled with rice and salmon. Make it nice and neat so you've got a channel down the middle. Continuing today's theme of strong and interesting flavours, my next guest is an old friend who's going to introduce us to a traditional Indian dish. Hello, Manju. Hello, Paul. How are you? I'm OK. Long time no see. I know. It's been, it's been a while, hasn't it? It has. Now, I was looking over at this here. I'm going to bring this over, this yeah. pie. Yes, pie. It is a pie. Well, visually, it looks like a pie, but this yeah. is actually, would you believe, a biryani. That's not a biryani. That's it a is. pie. No, it's not That's pie. That's got a lid on it. It's got a lid because it's known as a dumpakt pie. Dum means steam yeah. and pakt means choking. And the pie lid is made out of dough to choke the steam to cook what's inside it. So that's a traditional biryani yeah. inside there. Biryani is a dish cooked with rice, meat or vegetables. OK. And the meat or vegetables are cooked separately, the rice is cooked separately, and the two are combined. That's a biryani. So it's a biryani pie? No, it's not. Because... That's all I'm trying to hear. <laughs> That's all I'm trying to hear. Pie. Um, you see, it's, well, it's like yeah, a pie, it isn't it? Yeah, it is a pie. Generally, you're not meant to eat the pie crust. Yeah. Uh, it's discarded. I went to a restaurant in Delhi, and I started eating the crust of the biryani, and they I started would... laughing at me, saying, you're not meant to eat it, although it's edible. Manju is going to show me how to make her traditional dish. It's the closest thing to a pie in all of India. Now, you're going to show us how to make this. Yes, I am. So yeah. come and join me. Now, this that is your is... kitchen. If you need yeah? anything, okay. if you need to, any utensils, you want me to right. do anything, let me know. As I said, a biryani is made out of rice and vegetables, okay. and most biryanis around the world are made with basmati rice. Basmati. And I've got some basmati in here. What did you say, then? Basmati. Basmati. Mati, ma. Ma. Yeah. OK. <laughs> is it going to be a Hindi lesson as well? Yeah, it is. <laughs> Excellent. Now, you can rinse the rice grains, but bearing in mind that rice starts to cook once you add the water to it. Right. Okay. So I'm letting that simmer for eight to ten minutes. You want to partially cook it. This is my little spice tin. I'm making the garam masala from scratch, so we're going to spice our meat. Into a hot pan goes cumin seeds, coriander seeds, some green cardamoms, bay leaves, and some cloves. They're beginning to toast. Yeah, yeah. Quite nicely. Can you smell it? Oh, yeah, you can. That's fantastic. Yeah, you know the overwhelming it. smell I get from that? It's cumin. Because it's, it's, it's got a bit of a kick on it, isn't yes, it? Yes, it has. It's that kind of Indian smell. Yeah. And once they cool down, they turn brittle. Blend the spices into a fine powder. Can you smell it? Wow. Please. Manju is making a marinade, adding a homemade garam masala to natural yoghurt. With some root ginger and crushed garlic. Now, you can use chicken um, or vegetables, but predominantly, biryanis are made with meat or mutton. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, or that's... goat's meat, yeah. Now, that's what, what I would consider a biryani. Then a dash of lemon juice, olive oil and salt. The smell is incredible. You like it? Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. That's great. Interesting what you're yeah. doing with the chilli now. Yeah. You, do you use the whole seeds? Yes, I do, there? because the heat of the chilli is contained in the vein of the chilli, not the seeds. I know that. Ooh. Yes, I know. I'm impressed. <laughs> um, but... So it doesn't matter if you keep the seeds in. Okay. And it's too fiddly anyway. So, yeah, I'm just chopping a couple of chilies. Do this. I'm not very good at chopping, but anyway. Okay, okay yeah. yeah, that's fine. And just throw those Straight in there. Thin. Yeah. Two to three chilies. Okay. Depends on how hot the chilies are. Right. And how hot you like your biryani. Well, yeah, okay. I like it. I like that. I don't mind a bit of heat. That's fine. Yeah, good. It's, this is going to be really potent. So you throw in the meat. Yeah. And I use sort of lamb chunks 
and then you store this, the meat, in the fridge for about 10 to 15 minutes. OK. And then it ends up like this. It does smell incredible. Yeah? You just want uh, the meat to soak all the flavours up, mm -hmm. and the lemon juice is there to kind of break down the protein. Yep. So it acts as a tenderizer. OK, OK. So what I'm doing here is I'm heating my pan and adding my oil. And I was wondering if you could help me out with the, making the dough for the lid. Oh, here we go. Yeah? yeah OK. <laughs> I knew, I knew I was yeah. going to get dragged into this. OK. Is this it's the flour dragon. here? Yeah. I'm using whole wheat flour or chapati flour or atta. Simply mix the flour with water. You don't need to season as this dough will act as a lid for the biryani and won't be eaten. What I've done is I've heated some oil up and I've added... Uh, the marinating meat into the pan. It's, uh, the smell of that, I can't wait to smell that cooking. Now, I think I've made a pretty, um, pretty good dough. See? Yes, that is impressive, actually. Okay. Right, what I'd like you to do is cut it in half, or just break it in half. Yeah. And I'd like you to make a little sausage out of it. Not a little one, a large sausage-shaped one. Sausage or full? To fit the circumference. Ah, got you. Of... You're lining. Yeah. OK, I'll do that now. Just get that ready while I'm frying the meat. OK, so, so that's uh, reducing yep. considerably. Right, I think it's time to assemble. OK. What I'm going to do before, I've fried some onions, mm -hmm. so half of that goes in there. So that becomes the meat base or the sauce. OK. Right, let's uh, assemble. OK, what do you want me to do? Uh, what I'd like you to do is bring this here. Yep. And what we're going to do is we're going to layer it. You some... layer it inside there. OK. Yes. First start with the meat. Then spread over the partially cooked rice, oven roasted cashew nuts, some fried onions, and repeat. Finally, Manju's finishing touch. Milk infused with saffron and chopped mint. Nice, generous the layer. Smell. That's it. Right, quickly seal the dough. I'll clear this out. You please. want to put the dough around the outside? Yes, please. So if I sort of do that, I'll help you. seal it to the top. Yeah. And then I want you to roll out the dough. This is my rolling that's pin. That's a toothpick. That, that's not a rolling pin. <laughs> it is a rolling pin. It's my mum's rolling pin. You're being okay. rude oh, about my mum. I'm sorry. Mom's... I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, mum. OK. OK, roll it out uh, to uh, sort of uh, fit the top of the uh, lid. Done. Uh, a little... Is it quite thin? You don't want it too it's thick. The Mickey now. Not really? Quite, that's, that's really? Fine. Go for it. Yeah. OK. Because it's going to stick, you see. Do you want, do you want some water on that to make it stick? Or are you just going to no, chuck no, it No, no, I don't want it to stick. And then you just place it on the top, see? like so. All right, you do all your business then. OK. It is like making a pie. <laughs> OK, it's a biryani pie. Then... Stick it on the hob. Straight on there? Yeah. This recipe can be made in any pie dish and finished off in the oven. That's going to take how long now? About 20 to 25 minutes on a hob. OK, 25 minutes. That'll be cooked and we'll get a chance to eat that later. Yeah. I can't wait. My next recipe is a rich chocolate roulade with a flavour I've loved since I was a boy. Do you remember when peppermint really packed a punch? I remember in school, in the classroom, when someone was sucking on a mint in the class, the teacher used to go mad and say, if you're going to bring in sweets, bring enough for the rest of the class, and rightfully so. I want to make a pudding that's full of the best peppermint flavour possible. This is Summerdown Farm in Hampshire, where resident mint expert Ian Margots grows an old British peppermint crop called Black Mitchum. I absolutely love this stuff. I've worked with it since we have virtually nothing, and now we've got 100 acres, and, I, and you have to cherish this crop. You really have to cherish it to keep it in the fine order that it's in to look after it. Today, Ian is getting ready to harvest his crop. This peppermint is in, is in perfect condition uh, for a harvest. It's being laid out now as we are now with the mower going up and down the field. Be here for a couple of days, and then we will take it back to our distillery where we will distill it. The oil we're after in the peppermint plant is actually in the leaf. And in sunny weather, that just makes the oil rise to the surface, so it makes it much easier to distill. Ian grows and distills the peppermint oil under the watchful eye of Sir Michael Coleman, 
whose name you might recognise. It was Sir Michael's family who first set up Coleman's Mustard over a hundred years ago. Now he has turned his attention to perfecting peppermint after being inspired by Ian. He came back from a trip to um, America uh, and in his pocket he had a bag of sweets that had been made uh, with the quality American oil. And I tasted it and I suddenly said, wow, uh, this has got a characteristic which reminds me of humbugs when I was a boy. Uh, and I recognized that that was what peppermint used to be like. And I realized that we were onto a really good thing and I was determined we were going to share that around and show people what a really good pure oil of peppermint tasted like. The sweets Ian brought back were made with American peppermint oil, but actually produced using a British peppermint plant called Black Mitcham. This was popular back in the early 1900s and distilled here until the late 1940s. It's this peppermint that Sir Michael has reintroduced to the UK and now grows to produce his own peppermint oil. It's got a very a lingering flavour in the mouth and it gives a lovely cooling sensation. It's the menthol content and menthol is a really uh, wonderful uh, sensation if it's a quality product. Ian is responsible for distilling Sir Michael's peppermint to get the best possible flavour. What I'm doing here now, I'm just adjusting the steam pressure. Um, I always compare this to bringing uh, vegetables to the boil. So I've switched the steam on. I switch it on slowly so I don't get any uh, kickbacks. And now I've just turned the steam on and I'll bring it up to a certain pressure just so it gets the tub hot. And then when it's hot, I'll turn it down to simmer. And that's when we're cooking peppermint and we'll see peppermint coming out of the condenser. For me, this is the thrill, to end up with the peppermint oil in your hand. That's what the culmination of the whole year's work's been. The peppermint oil that is produced is going to be used in sweets and teas, and I cannot wait to use it in my next dish. So, Michael, Ian, welcome to my kitchen. Thank you. Um, is, this the, is this the real peppermint? We, we model what we grow today on the old-fashioned, uh, traditional, uh, quality, pure mint that used to be grown in this country. This is the real peppermint. This is the real black Mitchum peppermint. And if you get hold of a leaf there, uh, Paul, and rub it between your fingers and thumb, and you'll feel just and smell just how intense that is. Oh, wow, yeah. That is something you, you, know, you, you can't get anywhere Absolutely. else. It's not like the normal uh, spearmint that everybody knows as garden mint, yeah. uh, which is a totally different smell. How do you use that peppermint oil yourself? I mean, I've got my wife trained. She really likes peppermint tea. And uh, that's the big thing we use it for. Now, I'm going to use this peppermint in a roulade. And the combination I'm using is chocolate and peppermint in a flourless roulade using dark chocolate. I'm going to use Sir Michael's peppermint oil mixed in cream. It not only tastes great, it's going to look pretty good too. Now, to start with, you need to whisk up your eggs. Now, what I'm looking for is to take this to stiff peak. Now, that's pretty much there at the moment. The thing you do to test it is to hold it above your head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Right, right. There you go. <laughs> now, that's faith. That's faith right there. Yeah. OK. Now, what I'm going to do here is I've got egg yolks. Lots of sugar goes straight in there. I'm going to add that to the egg yolks. Beat together the egg yolks and cast the sugar until pale. Then add some good quality cocoa powder before pouring in melted dark chocolate. This mix is the base of my roulade. Don't worry if it thickens, this is quite normal. Now, what I'm going to do is add a scoopful of this meringue to this chocolate mixture to slacken it off a little bit. So I'll take some of this, take about a third, drop it in there. Now, what I'm going to do is loosen off this mixture because it's quite dense. 
you can beat this together at this stage because you're just slackening down the mix. You're introducing this chocolate flavour to the meringue. Get right round the sides. Now, that's perfect now to be added to the rest of the meringue. The problem is, if you were to add all that meringue in there, the air that you've got in there, the lightness that you've got in there, it would just sink all the way down with the chocolate. So now you've slackened that off, you can add a little bit more of the meringue to this. And this is where you're going to carefully fold. So we're going to go around the outside of the bowl, cut through the middle. So you gently fold this together. It takes a while, but don't try and rush it. You've got lovely light meringue there. My daughter makes a wonderful chocolate mousse. I oh, may yeah. get her to, to watch what you do. <laughs> does she use your peppermint oil as well? Yes, of course she does. <laughs> <laughs> Next, pour the mixture into a lined tin, making sure you spread it out evenly, tipping the tin up if you need to. So what you've got there is a beautiful base. That's your roulade base. Now, that goes into an oven at 160 fan for about 15 to 20 minutes. And you'll see it go slightly crispy on the top, and you'll see it pulling away from the sides. Now, I'm going to pop that straight in the oven. So what I want to do now is prepare the, the filling for it as well. Now, the peppermint oil, I'm going to use literally about three drops, very carefully. One, two, three, four. Now, that's probably going to be that's quite intense. Really That'll be nice. For the buttercream filling, I'm whisking together icing sugar and butter until light and creamy then slowly adding the milk, which has got peppermint oil already in it. This is the way of enabling it to go in all the buttercream. Oh, the smell, the smell of peppermint. Now, the buttercream in there is great, and it's fine, and I could probably go in the roulade as it is, but the addition of the dark chocolate as well brings it to another level. Stir that a little bit into the mixture. So what you've got is dark chocolate. You've got a peppermint buttercream in there as well. Now that is going to go beautifully inside the roulade. Take some baking parchment and give it a good dusting of icing sugar. Flip out your cake and peel off the paper. Yeah, I think well done. <laughs> <laughs> so there we have our roulade base, onto which I'm going to put the Peppermint, buttercream. Okay, uh, there's, a, there's a heady mix going on here between chocolate and peppermint that you can't smell, so you're going to have to make it. Now spread the buttercream over the cake, making sure you get right to the edges and it's nice and even. Now I'm going to roll this up, and this is the tricky bit. Now, the way to do it, you can get a palette knife or a knife and just what we call break its back. So you make a ridge about half inch in and just break it all the way down so it's loose. Then fold that first bit up and that will be the inside. Then basically you roll it over, release it all the way back. Now you can see it's beginning to crack. That's absolutely fine. And again, nice and tight. Try and keep it as tight as you possibly can with the paper. Look at that. The final roll comes over. Wow. Oh, wow. And then you release the paper totally. And there you have your basic roulade. Place it on there. And for me, a little drizzle more of icing sugar. Mm. A work of art. I hope this does justice to your peppermint oil chocolate and peppermint roulade. My roulade is delicious on its own, but even better when served with fresh strawberries or even a raspberry coulis. We can't eat at the moment. We'll have to eat it a little bit later. Well, we, we'll look forward to it in anticipation. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier, Manju Mali showed me her take on a traditional baked rice dish, a biryani, a kind of pie. Well, in my eyes, but now it's my turn. 
I'm going to show you now my interpretation of a baked rice dish. Ooh. And I'm taking my inspiration this time from Russia. And I'm making a kulibak, a pie wrapped in puff pastry and filled with rice, baked salmon and soft-boiled eggs. And I'm going to give it an extra kick by adding some spices. Over here, I've got some onions which are frying away. Now, this is where I'm going to ask for your help. I want to put some spices in that mm. to give it a little bit of a kick and I wish you want to sort of grind down. What would you advise I use? Well, you're using, as I can see, parsley and dill. Yep. Um, so you don't want to mess up the flavours too much. So I'd uh, use some uh, basic spice, such okay. as cumin seeds and a bit of coriander. I'll give you your toy. OK. <laughs> so what are you going to throw in there well, first? What I'm going to add is a bit of cumin, mm -hmm. a touch of coriander. Yep. Now, what you could do is toast them on a dry pan yeah. and then grind them up. OK. But uh, you can do this, it's fine. Well, if that's just ground down, I'm going to chuck it in with the onions. Yeah. So I'll just yeah, that's fry fine. that out slightly. Yeah. OK. Now, is that, is that being ground down? Uh, not totally. Don't you want sort of bits of uh, spice? I don't mind okay. if it's got little, little chunky bits oh, in there. OK, you, know? you want chunky bits? No, 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 I quite like that. All right, here you go. Here's Lovely. mostly ground, yeah? Lovely. Happy? That's, that's perfect. OK. Now, I'll throw that straight in. <laughs> OK, so I've got the onions in there with the spices that Manju's carefully selected, into which I'm going to add some mushrooms. Now, the mushrooms are in there. It's going to release a little bit of water in there as well. Now, all I'm going to do is build up the basic rice dish. On top of that, I'm going to put some salmon, on top of that, an egg, and then encrust the whole thing in puff pastry. Now, that would take a couple of minutes. I'll turn the heat down a little bit. And the rice is completely cooked? Yes, now, rice is completely cooked. What I'm going to do is just mix it with the mushrooms, the onions, a little bit of zest of lemon. Now, that's going to go inside there with the mushrooms now. That will do. Is this like a salmon en croute? Dish. Well, that's all a pie is, really. I always think of a pie as being a, a dish that basically is whatever you're cooking wrapped up in a shell and then everything is in there and it's keeping nice and moist. Now, if I just turn that heat off now... It's really quick. So once you've got that in there, a little bit of seasoning... ..and then leave that to cool. It takes about a good half an hour because you can't use the hot mixture going on top of the pastry, because the whole point, when you're making a pie, you've got to keep your puff pastry nice and cold. That's how you get the laminations in there, that's how you get the steam, and that's why it jumps. Tip the rice mixture into a bowl. Now I'm adding some roughly chopped parsley and dill, but you could use coriander or any of your favourite herbs. Lead to cool before wrapping in puff pastry. I've made mine, but shopboard will work too. So this is the base of the coolie back. I'm just going to stretch slightly. And over there, could you pass me that dish, please? Over here, I have my cool rice. Yes. So I'm going to get my hands in there. I don't. You can use implements if you want. I like to get my hands in there because I need to shape this. Well, you've washed them, so it's all right. I have. <laughs> so again, run this down the middle. Keep so it the nice filling and is neat. completely cold? Yes, the filling is completely... If I was to put warm rice on this, the whole thing about the puff pastry would melt and you wouldn't get that rise. And so the whole idea at this stage is to keep everything as cool as possible. So, again, make it nice and neat so you've got a channel running down, right down the middle. Take it close to the end and then square it off like so. That's a good level of rice. The next thing we're going to add to this dish is the salmon. Obviously cooked, and you want to break the pieces off and lay them neatly across the top. Try not to get any down the side. I want to try and build up some layers in this. Finally, top with sliced boiled eggs. Make sure it's nice and neat. And over here, I've got just basically a beaten egg. Now, this is going to be the sealant for the top. So brush it all around the edge. Get your lid. Pop that onto the top. And then push it right the way down onto the tray. Be quite firm with it. It's like a blanket, really. And so what I'm going to do is just trim this down a little bit, neaten it up all the way around. I like to then give it a little bit of decoration around the outside. Basically, two fingers and your thumb go round 
and seal it all off and make it look a bit more attractive. Finally, egg wash on the top. Now, what I tend to do as well, you can, what, what I call double egg washing. So what you can do with this is then pop this in the fridge, leave it for about half an hour for the eggs to set, re-egg wash it, and then, using a, the back of a blade, the blunt bit, you just run your knife over the top, and that makes little indentations in the egg, which gives it a nice pattern when it comes out the oven. Now, that needs to be baked for about 25 minutes at 180 in the oven. Now, this will go beautiful golden brown. Leave it in there. It will all puff up and look absolutely gorgeous. So this one I'm going to pop in the fridge just to chill it down and it'll be ready to go in the oven. However, I have one in the oven ready just for you. Thank you. All for me. Oh, wow. Look at that. Wow. There you have it. Look how flaky it is. It's even flaking off as we speak. That is my version of a baked rice dish. The coolie back. My coolie back is best served with roasted onions, carrots, and parsnips, or simply as a supper on its own with a sour cream dill sauce. For me, today has been all about flavors. Starting with my shallot, chive and onion tart with the help of Dr. Mariel Jones. And we brought back an old-fashioned flavour in my chocolate and peppermint roulade, thanks to the hard work of Sir Michael Coleman and Ian Margots. And of course, Manju's biryani with that lid, full of Indian spices, which I can't wait to try. Finally, my coolie back, salmon and egg in a pie, it's going to be delicious. There must be a gap on there somewhere. There is. <laughs> just, just a little bit. I'm waiting for this, so that's fine. Thank you very much for coming today. And I hope you enjoy this spread of food that we've all got. I think there's enough here to feed a, a very small army. <laughs> um, so tuck in, guys, and tell me what you think. Thank you. Okay. First, it's my shallot, chive, and onion tart. The tart's awesome. The lemon, the, the onion tart. Mm. That, it's that sweetness in the, in the tart, isn't it? It's coming yeah. through. Absolutely. Mm. It's sweet, but with a bit of savoury in there. It's great. Yeah. I'm hoping my guests enjoy the chocolate and peppermint roulade. It's quite light, actually. Mm. Mm. It is. But in fact, the thing that lightens it up is your, is your um, peppermint oil. It just lifts it up. It's lovely. I really I, I'm certainly going to use that one again. Oh, good. Mm. Me too. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, it's the pies. Manju's biryani and my puff pastry coolie back. I do like this biryani. Yeah. Fantastic flavours. Do you like the coolie back? I think it's the layers yes. of the egg. Beautiful. It's all about texture, isn't it? Textures, flavours. Absolutely, isn't it? You're right. I think the onion tart goes really well with the biryani, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's it does. Different cultures, different it does. cuisines. Yeah, it does go well together. This is what it's all about: a groaning table, great food, and great company. Join me again next time on Pies and Pods. Does anyone want some more roulade? <laughs>